Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, resume a little bit uh, the story. So the story is uh, given uh, a system with a symmetry of uh, associated to a group G and uh, living in dimension D. We are able uh, to uh, identify, let's say, the irreducible representation of this group. To them, we associated fields. And in terms of them, we write down expressions which uh, either uh, uh, satisfy the group symmetry or explicitly they break. So example, and uh, by the way, is the uh, set of theory on which uh, we'll concentrate the attention uh, essentially most. If we take Z2, uh, Z2 admit uh, a one-dimensional representation in terms of only one bosonic field, phi, phi of x. In terms of phi of x, you can uh, write down the most general uh, interaction which respect Z2 symmetry. Uh, in terms of a function which is even, this function admit a uh, uh, series expansion like this, and therefore these coefficients are our coupling constant. This is what respect the symmetry. On the other hand, the one which explicitly breaks the symmetry is something that, uh, let's say, like this, where this uh, is uh, once again even, or if you want, you write down here some. Uh, uh, expansion like this, and therefore you have infinite set of couplings. Now you can repeat the same exercise if you take another group. So in general, uh, for uh, the most general setting of conformal field theory will be the so-called versumino witten model, based on a group G that is uh, typically a Lie group. Okay, but the scheme is exactly what I told you. So once identify, you identify the group, you identify the reducible representation. They are associated to local fields, and you write down in terms of them monomial, which respect or break explicitly the symmetry. Now, once you have this mental uh, construction, you associate to a group the infinite coupling constant associated to this group, under which uh, this coupling under RG transformation flow. So you change the scale, the effective Hamiltonian change, and therefore the coupling constants are moving. These are dictated by the beta function associated to the coupling. And the most important things that we will use from now on is that in this set of theories, there are fixed points and uh, the fixed point characterized by all the beta function of your theory to be zero. And this implies that the correlation length at this point is infinity. So I'm, uh, I'm stressing this because typically people revert the things. They say critical points are those which has correlation function infinity. It's false. What is critical point is the beta functions to be zero. These imply this, but it's not true the vice versa. Example, if you have a massless flow between two fixed, non-trivial fixed points, along this trajectory the coupling are moving, so this is no longer true, and correlation function is infinity. So, so beta function equals zero is the critical points. And these uh, critical points, under very general assumption that today we'll uh, review, are associated to conformal field theory. Okay? So, 
say in shortly, a field theory is associated to flow or G once you fixed the group and the dimension. At this point, the uh, operator content, there are infinite number of fields, as you immediately understand from what I'm saying. The content of the field reorganized accordingly of the vicinity of the fixed point you are looking at. So, mentally, you focus the attention on one of them, having in mind the ambitious goal will be to classify all fixed points, to understand all the topology of this space and so on and so forth, but mentally, you localize your attention around one fixed point, and around one fixed point, you ask the question, what is the operator content of my theory? How I can organize my fields? Which one are the relevant operator? Which one are the irrelevant operator with respect to that fixed point? And the reason I'm doing that is that nearby this fixed point, you will describe your field theory in terms of an action, of an Hamiltonian, depending on what language you like, let's say an action, that you parameterize in terms of some action conformal field theory that will uh, uh, characterize in the due course some of the couplings associated uh, to the relevant operators. So their number will be finite. Okay? So this is uh, the description of the class of universality associated to the fixed point spun by a finite number of relevant operators. Now, geometrically, these relevant operators are the instable direction of this fixed point. So you have to imagine, as an analogy, like you are on top of the hill, this fixed point are really like top of the hill, very unstable. But then you can go down the hill in this way, in this way, in this other way, and so on. So the relevant uh, operator are telling you how you can get out on the fixed point. Of course, associated with a fixed point, there is an infinite number of re irrelevant operators that bring you in. But for what concerns thermodynamics and things like that, the, how to say, the epistemological point of view is that uh, these irrelevant fields are coming from other fixed points under which other fixed points were unstable and is bringing you in. Okay? So I want to say that the typical approach which proved to be successful for for a reason you understand immediately, is to characterize field theory around one fixed point in terms of deformation or the fixed point action by a finite number of relevant operators. Now, of course, you might be crazy enough to say, I want instead to characterize my action in terms of perturbing by irrelevant operator, namely reversing the flow. Now, in principle can be done, but what happens is that in absence of any further constraint, which might mean integrability, supersymmetry, whatever else, something very robust, you are unable to get the trajectory perturbatively stable. Because while an action like this if I start doing perturbation theory with respect to this point, perturbation theory means within this theory, I'm in principle no all correlation function I'm talking about. And an action like this is stable in perturbation theory, meaning that at higher order, I might change the value of these guys, but the form of the action remains exactly the same. If I reverse the point of view of perturbing 
my theory by irrelevant operator, even one. So I imagine I'm crazy enough to say plus lambda irrelevant operator. What happens is that as, as soon as I start doing the perturbation theory with that, the two-point function of this with respect to this is divergent. Therefore, I have to add a contour term in terms of a new irrelevant operator. But this guy starts to diverge himself as well. So you should add another one, not talking about higher order. So this means that once you perturb by irrelevant operator, the action even you start with is in unstable. So to make it stable, perturbatively, you need to add infinite number of contour terms and fixing the renormalization condition. So this means that in absence of a prescription of how you can fix this infinite number of terms, the theory is not predict anything. Because you need infinite set of conditions to fix the parameters. At this point, you have uh, exhausted the, all the question you might ask to the theory, because you have spent all your energy and time fixing this without computing anything. So the only point where this point of view might be useful is if you know the trajectory you want to go through come from, uh, let's say, integrable trajectory. Integrable means it's really stable, and there is only one way to keep the theory integrable perturbatively, and therefore this fix uniquely these parameters. And therefore you can keep going. But I have to say that unless you are really, one, masochistic, be good enough, forget about this. Okay? So the real scheme to deal with a field theory is this one. So fixed point, which rule in our scheme the ultraviolet behavior of the theory perturbed by relevant operator. Okay? So this is the good starting point and a good uh, point of view to deal with uh, a field theory. So from now on, what uh, we are going to do is uh, exactly what I wrote there, namely mentally I'm focusing the attention one specific point. At the end of our, our, our lecture, we'll see that I'm able, fixing the group, to classify all these infinite number of fixed points. So it's an amazing achievement. So somehow I, I will have full control of this space of coupling and all the renormalization group around it. But as I say, the starting point is that you are around one fixed point to start with. Around this fixed point, my theory is described by some uh, operator content which uh, I am uh, I'm able to spot, namely the number of relevant operators. This will become a dynamical question for us, namely which are the relevant operators, and taking this point of view. So essentially what you have to think is, for instance, two-point function of, of an operator of, of anomalous dimension x, what you have to think is that so this is the general, the most general form of two-point function of a scaling operator of dimension delta in which is just a way of smartly parameterize this correlation function in which you isolated this term power law time a scaling function which depends r over c. Okay? So this is the most general form of two-point function that you can have. So you see that uh, from this point of view, you will have a pure scaling behavior as far as this guy is a constant. So you can have uh, essentially in two regime, which is the beauty of this story, that you can always uh, interplay the role. You can think either R 
much, much smaller than Xi, but Xi finite, or vice versa, Xi infinity, and R whatever. Okay? There are two different ways of interpreting things. So, from the first way, when I keep Xi finite, finite but large, finite but large, means that I'm nearby here, but not really sitting at a fixed point, I'm slightly away from it. And my conformal field theory is ruling the ultraviolet behavior of the theory. So this is the rule. Conformal field theory fully control the ultraviolet behavior of the theory and somehow has the ambitious to tell you all about how the theory behaves short distance. Vice versa, you can take different point of view that you really just sit on the point, you just sit there. At this point, correlation length is infinity, and therefore this term is absent, is a constant. Okay? So from now on, keep in mind this, but I will, in order to develop the theory further on, I'm just pretending to sit there and therefore providing all the equation about the behavior of the correlation function and stuff like that. Okay? Clear, everybody? Questions? Yeah. No, perturbatively they created no problem whatsoever. Yeah. So if you have no function, you cannot have, if length is a constant, you cannot have an almost dimension. No, no, you can. But then the dimension of phi? This is, uh, I was just uh, going to comment, thanks for, the, for uh, your question. Now, there is uh, something uh, absolutely uh, odd in what I wrote was my next comment, in a way. And this uh, uh, explains the uh, necessity to have a, a, a lattice, if you want, or a microscopic scale, or if you want, a renormalization scale lambda. It's crucial. In field theory, it's crucial. What I mean is, here uh, it looks I'm like in the continuum. I am. But imagine that I have, because by the way, I can have a Lagrangian to describe my criticality. Let's imagine. So I will have a Lagrangian density that make me the action. Now Lagrangian density, of course, has to be built according to certain rule. One of the rules is that you should have an equation of motion not higher than two, otherwise the theory becomes, once again, unpredictable, probably locality, blah, blah, blah. So this means that this guy should have a term like this. Then it might have many others, but a term like this should be there. Once I have a term like this, I'm stuck. Because from the fact that this is a pure number in opportunity unit, and this is a volume, and volume never renormalized, this is a derivative, this means this guy has a very well-defined scaling behavior that you can work it out easily. Okay? So this field is, in terms of L, something. Exercise, work it out what is this something. Okay? So this means uh, that the field I'm talking about has very unique things. But if this is the scaling behavior of this guy, any time that I'm computing correlation function of that field, this for me was a composite field. Sorry for the, let me use phi, let's say. This correlation function cannot have any other relation than this one, because the, 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 anomal, the, the, 
the dimension will be d minus 2 half. So, this is fixed. How the hell I can have something uh, different here? Never. So, the only way out is that the theory has some hidden scale, hidden, which means microscopic lattice, high energy cutoff, such that I can put here something which absorb, work it out what should be the power here, and then I can have the things I like it. Okay? Clear? Namely, I can be sure the way to conciliate the things is anything I'm writing here, essentially, there is a hidden scale, which is like this, A over R to D to delta. This is a pure number, so a pure number I can take any power I like it. Times a scale A minus T minus 2, for instance. Clear? This is a crucial point of all the story. You do not have anomalous behavior if you do not have divergences. You can never have. Therefore, the underlying cutoff has to be there for very good reason, although, to simplify the life and this and that, you put A equal 1. So this is the reason why in the book you never see this A. But if you think a minute, the equation which is under your eyes, like the one I wrote before, is mean, meaningless. Unless I have a scale which absorbs the extra dimension. Clear to everybody? This is a crucial point of the story, conceptually. Without divergences, alias, without the need to have a cutoff, you can never have any anomalous behavior. Everything will be fixed just by pure dimensionality of the quantity. You can never transmute them. Clear? There was a couple of questions there. No, no, ultraviolet. Ultra yeah. Yes, it's, it's the randomization groups that drive us to the critical point. And randomization groups. As I say, look, it's a question point of view. I cut the story taking a very well defined recipe. Now, once again, you can take the reverse point of view, which is really statistical physics point of view, that you are slightly close to some fixed point here. And then you say, I make my renormalization group work for me if I apply more and more and more, I'm going in. This is the is honest point of view. I'm not disputing. I mean, it's also a historical point of view. Fine. Because you interpret renormalization group as something which is driving you the large distance. So you are taking the reverse point of view. Okay? Perfectly fine. But to control in this way the theory, we require, we are required to control the infrared. Namely, to have the theory defined with a mass scale, write it down everything in terms of a mass, and then check what happens if the mass is going to zero. Okay? And then this causes infrared problem. Now, fine. I'm not saying anything. However, I would prefer to have a scheme where perturbatively I know what I'm doing order by order. And the scheme somehow is revert without losing generality because any relevant trajectory should come from someone else. So it should be relevant with respect to another fixed point. Okay? So from this point of view, I'm not losing anything. So your question I could have addressed, please change the fixed point you start from and use my scheme. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. The difficulties is to revert the order if you are here and you want to go all the way through, up. This will be perturbatively pretty tough if you do not have extra condition. Okay? It's just how to say mental sanity to have something under control, order by order. Other questions? Yeah. What is the length scale that R is representing? 
No, R, uh, yeah, yeah, you are right, sorry. R here was uh, modulus of X, sorry, thank you for the. So I'm saying that this under uh, rotation, symmetry, and so on will not depend on X here, of course, is a vector, but depend just on the modulus because I'm assuming rotation invariance. Okay? So summarizing, this is just an example of two point function. So two point and higher order function, you can always parameterize in some factor which take in account anomalous scaling of the operator <coughs> times function which are scaling in, uh, function which are depend on uh, uh, ratio of R in general R, I and J with respect to length scale. Okay, so this is general parameterization. However, if you want to describe conformal field theory, you are sitting on one of these points and this go this extra function goes away, is a constant. Constant which uh, essentially fixed the normalization of this field, and therefore from now on I'm gonna take one. Okay? So these functions for me will be one once I assume a well-defined normalization of the fields, which after all means I assume a well-defined normalization of the G, because the way how I split the importance of G and phi depends how I normalize the fields. Clear? Clear, everybody? Okay, so, with all these uh, things being said, which clarify essentially what we are doing. From now on, I would like really to sit on one of these fixed points and carry out all the consequences of that. So I want to uh, solve, so our goal will be solve the dynamics of the fixed point. points, so there are S. However, as I said, I focus the attention on one of them. Okay? So, one of them is just to have a well-defined action to work, but I know in my mind that there may be many others, and I will face the problem how they are connected later. So, we want to solve the dynamics so we say yesterday that the fixed point intrinsically are strong coupling, strong coupled theory. Because the degrees of freedom of a theory dynamically is xi to the d. Xi is infinity at the fixed point. So this theory are infinitely many coupled theory. From this point of view, it seems hopeless. Yeah, but this theory is acquired a scaling invariance. Because since everything depends on distance divided by C, since C is infinity, I can rescale my distance from any factor I want it. So the fixed point will be dilatation invariant. So what I want to show you is the following. We can solve the theory under uh, the under a result which is due to Polyakov, and this result uh, reads like this: If you have a theory which is translation invariance, rotational invariance, local and invariant under dilatation, automatically your theory is invariant under conformal transformation. Now, I have to tell you what conformal transformation is and what, how this hypothesis enter in this proof. Okay? So I want to show you the following. So 
So first of all, let's imagine that I have a correlation function several fields here with some index, which are given with some uh, path integral in terms of some uh, things, which is written like this. And these fields are essentially composite field of this one I'm using in my measure. Okay? This will not be as essential uh, later on. So somehow I will uh, use this formula to derive my result, and then I will take this formula, poof, throw it away. Okay? Just mentally way of organizing my argument. Namely, my correlation function I associate to some path integral. This is what it is. The only thing is that most of the time we do not really know to write down concretely this path integral. But the fact that it is an average on this is a... Okay. Now, the fact that... Uh, so I'm telling you theory local, translation invariance, rotational invariance, and dilatation invariance. Okay? So this is uh, the hypothesis of uh, Polyakov. So the fact that uh, the theory is local means that if I make a change uh, of my coordinate, something which is really kind of general general uh, transformation of the coordinate. So I'm just changing my metric, essentially. After all, it's just uh, labeling of the things. The fact that the theory is local is as much as saying that exists a field that will be crucial in all our story associated to this change of coordinate, which is the stress energy tensor, alias locality means that the variation of my action under this transformation, I can always write down in terms of a local object in this way. Okay? So if you have taken a course of general relativity, you know that the response of a theory to a change of coordinate is dictated by the stress energy tensor. So the stress energy tensor is nothing else than the variation of the action with respect to the change of coordinate. Okay? So locality means that if I do this transformation locally, the theory say, Look, exists a very specific operator, which is the one which appears in expressing this transformation. So locality means this. Okay, now, translation invariance, what does it mean? It means that my theory, actually, the action has to be invariant if I take this and having an infinitesimal constant shift. Delta S has to be zero. This means invariance. Okay? What kind of uh, constraint this imply this symmetry? Well, what you do is you integrate by part. Epsilon now is arbitrary infinitesimal constant. So translation means that the stress energy tensor is conserved quantity. And then you know that if you integrated a conserved quantity, the temporal part, you get the corresponding charges. And from stress energy tensor, the conserved charges are respectively Hamiltonian and momentum of the fields, because then you have an extra index to play with. If I choose mu equal zero, I can have mu, that is zero, one, two, blah, blah, blah. So I will have d-dimensional constant. Rotational invariance means that if you take your vector and you updated it with an infinitesimal 
anti-symmetric tensor because rotation mixed x1 with x2, x2 with x1, but the coefficients are anti-symmetric. Remember, it's cosh, sinh, minus sinh, cosh. So there's a minus sign. So if uh, I insert these things here, what happened? The derivative will act on these things. And therefore, I have delta S has to be T mu nu, omega mu nu. And this has to be 0. The way to realize this is that the stress energy tensor has to be symmetric. Clear? So rotation means T mu nu equal T nu mu. Clear? And finally, what is dilatation? Dilatation is xA going in xA plus lambda xA. Because I'm stretching the same xA, the same. Okay? So, when you do this, you will see immediately that this is computing the trace of your object. Because this mu is equal nu, become delta. Because my vector xA is exactly, there is no index, it's exactly the same index. So dilatation implies T mu nu contract index, the trace has to be zero. Clear? Calculations are elementary. Eh? That's what uh, I've done this. So, yeah. Just a, a remark. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that we're getting too much whether the indices are upstairs or downstairs. Yeah, yeah, because we are Euclidean. It's true. Is this, if we generalize the model to the case where the. It is, it is. Although it become a little odd, you have to distinguish time from space, but you can do it, yeah. For instance, electrodynamics in absence of uh, charges in the vacuum is a conformal field theory in full glory in uh, ordinary space-time. You can do it. I'm just making this uh, cavalier approach because we had in mind, as I said at the very beginning, the idea to discuss phase transition, statistical physics model, where x is on the same level, the same footing of time. And therefore, bringing index up and down, I don't care. Yeah, indeed. I could have. I write this because we'll become explicit in the familiar form that you are summing on mu. This is why I'm writing. If I would have written it like this, you might get confused that I'm just saying mu. So, I'm referring to your knowledge and your familiarity with, uh, how to say, general relativity to say that if you have two index like this the same, you are meaning sum on the same index. But if you don't like it, this is as much as sum on mu between 1 and d, d mu mu. Okay. Okay. So, Summarizing, we have just used things. So let me tell you, locality means T mu nu exists and is a local field. Symmetry, uh, trans, how to say, translation, D mu, T mu equals zero. Rotation, dilatation equals zero. Now, under this assumption, Polyakov come around and say, look, if your stress energy tensor satisfies this constraint, the theory is invariant under larger set of coordinate transformation which fulfill this condition.
Okay. Now you say, where the hell you take this equation from? Well, it's very simple. If I do a change of coordinate, I'm changing my matrix, right? Matrix is 2 tensor 2, okay? So let's go and compute the change of the matrix. So I have my space. which I write in this way. If I change coordinate, the new G mu nu will be given by delta x prime A, delta x prime B, dx A, dx B. Right? So this will be the new matrix, will be the old one, time this Jacobian, right, is a tensor of order 2. Now, imagine that I impose that the new matrix has just a rescaling, it's called Weyl factor, so I'm not screwing completely the matrix. I want to be strictly proportional to the oldest one times a factor, so I'm imposing that the new matrix will be equal to the old one times an overall factor. Okay? So meaning, uh, when you change matrix, you are really stretching your system. But sometimes you stretch, you turn, and you do like this. No, what I'm doing is, I have some matrix underlined. I pretend that locally, I want to measure my, my things in a different gauge. So instead of centimeter, I want to me uh, measure in kilometers. So I have to make a dilatation factor, okay, locally, that can change point by point. So this is called Weyl rescaling. So I'm not imposing that the matrix change in the most wildly way, because it will be a tensor of order two. I'm imposing, is a condition, that my new matrix will change that just with a local factor. Exercise, imposing this implies that the transformation, this C I'm using, has to satisfy this one. Namely, d mu C nu plus this one, you understand has to be symmetric because this object is symmetric. Has to be proportional to g mu nu. And now, the proportionality is very easy to fix, because if I take trace left and right, I should have the gradient here. And what is the proportionality factor? The fact that here I have two terms, but here I have d. So 2 over d. Clear? This is the... I'm uh, transforming my coordinate with a function. So I have a C which depends on X. I'm taking the gradient. It's a product, yeah, yeah. Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Times Jimmy Nu later. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I want to say, this term has to be proportional to g mu nu, whatever was. Okay? And this is the... Now, when you do all stuff, since at the end we care about flat matrix, we take g mu nu to be delta mu nu. This is the usual story. So first you go to curve space, you make all the variation on the things, but once you've done the derivative, you go to the flattened space. Okay? Clear? So, 
coordinate conformal transformation are those which satisfy this equation. So let me rewrite in full glory. Okay. So this is the these are the differential equation which characterize geometrically the so-called conformal transformation. Now, geometrically, conformal transformation are those that rotate the vector. It might even invert the vector, so something 10 becomes 1 over 10. But the angle between two vectors are always the same. So, conformal transformation is stretching locally of the distance uh, gauge, but in such a way that any vectors define, so you have uh, before some vectors like this, and the point x, after I do this transformation, this might go in uh, something, uh, let me exaggerate it, something like, like this. So what happened is that this uh, a uh, guy has been turned around and dilated enormously. The same dilatation factor is applied to that, but the angle that was between them remained exactly the same. Okay? So, conformal transformation geometry is very, very easy. It is uh, all transformation which stretch, rotate, do something to individual length of the vector, but never change the angle. So, for instance, all cartographic map has this kind of property, yeah. Uh, sometimes I heard that conformal transformations are not diffeomorphisms. Well, by your definition, it seems to be that once you know the Jacobian, you know how the metric transforms... I'm infinitesimal, then... this is the point. I'm infinitesimally close to what I was before. I'm not cutting anything. I'm not doing any severe things to my theory. I'm really infinitesimal. Indeed, you will see that this will be crucial later. Any transformation done here, I'm not cutting my manifold. I'm not doing anything. I'm just making stretching of the things. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the before and after. If, you do, if by this you mean the feomorphism. I mean, when uh, is a one-to-one -one mapping between the oldest coordinate and the new one? No, no, there is no jump. The thing I was wondering is, uh, if I know the Jacobian of this transformation, yeah. am I able to know how the metric transforms, or is it something that I have to specify later? If it's things locally, which doesn't concern boundary conditions, stuff like this, uh, funny Riemann surfaces like this, you have not to care, on, you have only to care about Jacobian. Okay. Full stop. <laughs> no, in any case, I mean, look, the, the point of view is really very simple. Take the Fermi, Enrico Fermi point of view, simplicity. So I'm just saying I'm really infinitesimally close to what was previous. I cannot lose anything. I'll just change in the way I'm measuring. So it's one-to-one -one correspondence. Therefore, once you act infinitesimally, you will see that this will uh, fire back later, this argument, but at this stage is what I'm doing. So if I infinitesimally am looking change of a matrix like this, this is what you got. So I'm not concerning uh, global property of my surface or my manifold with this, because this is a different question. Okay? That might be addressed through this technique, but later. On now. Okay? Now, exercise. You can check that uh, within this transformation, of course, there should be what we build us. Indeed, you see immediately that translation, rotation, uh, 
and dilatation satisfy what is called, uh, uh, what is this equation is about, okay? Our solution of this differential equation. But there are more, and the more is what enlarge the group from this previous uh, transformation to a new one, and this uh, transformation I can tell you in word I can write, but the thing is you take a vector, you shrink one over the length of the vector, which is allowed because shrinking is allowed. Once you have making uh, the one over the vector, you add a translation, and then you invert again. It's clear? So in the usual sense, you have a vector, you add a constant. Is what I've done this. Within the solution of this equation, there is an extra one, which consists taking a vector, shrinking one over the vector, is a dilatation, add a translation, you have a new vector, invert it. Okay? Now, in two dimensions, the thing is very, very simple. Imagine you have a football ball, okay? Now, you see that uh, uh, in this, uh, this is uh, just nothing else, the Riemann sphere. Because the, our plane will be compactified to a sphere as far as I include the point at infinity. Now, what are the transformations that never change uh, angle relation on this sphere. Imagine you have in the plane, you draw things. This will be mapped into the sphere. And then you want to understand what are the transformations that never change the angle. Very simple. You just roll the sphere on the plane. If you don't cut the sphere, you just roll it on the plane. You will see that all these angles are changing because you might bring from the origin to the North Pole when they are projected, they have become crazy, but the angle remains the same. Okay? Clear? So, in more general cases, the things are much... are these things. So, you will see that if you have a transformation of this type, when I go in this... Uh, things, I want to show you that the action is invariant. How? Because I told you that this is symmetric. So this means that if I add the symmetric part, will be the same. Because in any case, the trace of this guy with this extra index will select out the symmetric part. So originally it was this, but I'm the freedom to add this. But if these things satisfy this condition, I can substitute this with uh, uh, 2 d d mu over c times g mu nu. But summing mu nu on t mu nu is as much as taking the trace. So this will be integral t mu mu something something. But this guy was zero. Okay? Therefore, the action, the variation, the action is zero under this transformation. Clear? Clear, everybody? So, what are the most general solutions of these equations? The most general solution is this one. Xi to be Xi plus Ai xi to be lambda xi. Actually here, sorry, I can write down more general.
So the most general solution, solutions of this equation are given by Lorentz transformation. So here I'm uh, encoding this matrix, essentially the rotation. Okay? If you are in uh, Lorentz, you have the boost rather than the rotation. So this will be, let me call the Lorentz matrix with uh, cavalier uh, languages, alias will be rotation uh, matrices if I'm Euclidean, but will be also boost and rotation in higher things, plus translation, dilatation. And then this is the spatial conformal transformation I was telling you. First, I take the vector. I invert, sorry, through its modulus. So this new vector, of course, now the modulus is 1 over x. I add something, and then I define this inverting. OK? So the logic is I take a vector, I shrink, I add, and then I invert the story. So let's count parameters. So this guy is anti-symmetric 1 in d dimension, will be d, d minus 1, 1, plus d here. Here I have one parameter, lambda, and here I have d parameters for this translation b. OK? So if you add all together, you have at your disposal d plus 1, d plus 2, half. This is the number of parameters associated to the conformal group. Questions? No, uh, otherwise Polyakov would not be Polyakov. <laughs> it's a new additional. Yeah, this is the point. This is exactly the point. You start from something, and the theory, poof, give you some extra things. This is usually is called enhanced symmetry. It happens eh, many, many times in physics. You can define, yeah, yeah, you, you can define all, uh, all this. But essentially, the key point of all the story is that stress energy tensor with the property I enumerated, conservation, symmetry, and the traceless, implies automatically something else. So this is uh, the stress energy tensor is the key actor in all the story. Yeah, it's, it's what I said. Really, literally, you take a vector, x, i, you divide by its norm. So this new vector now is nothing, the norm of this new vector is 1 over the previous one. It's an allowed symmetry, is allowed, because dilatation is allowed. Translation is allowed. So this is the point, you see is the combination of these two guys that were already there. Uh, I'm talking to you. You see, the, the interesting thing is that you are using exactly the transformation that you had to create something extra. Because dilatation you had. You, are freedom, you have the freedom to change the vector the way you like it. In particular, you use the lamp for the vector to shrink it. You shrink it, dilatation was there to any vector, in particular to this one, translate it, and now you apply again. So there is no new operation, but from uh, building of these two operations that were there, you get something new. Yeah, yeah, it's what it is. But No, no, B is a parameters. Because this, uh, I mean, guys, I can uh, 
translated as much as I want. And this is completely independent from the translation of this vector. No, it's completely independent. It's a local dilatation. It's a local dilatation. Yeah. So the difference between the scale invariant and the formal invariant is these parameters, the number of parameters? Yeah. Okay, so now, now there is some uh, black magic going on. What I mean is, uh, at the beginning, uh, I use these two guys, these three guys, essentially, and I got this other one. So the message in a nutshell is that I have enlarged my symmetry, but essentially by D. I had just acquired new D parameters there. In any case, the conformal group has a finite number of parameters. Okay? So then you can ask, how the hell you can pretend to solve a field theory which has an infinite number of fields to constrain in terms of a finite number of parameters? Well, obviously, you cannot. The moral things we are here is like if I tell you, you have a theory which depends on x1, x2, x3, which say is spherical symmetric. At this point, the only thing you can say is that my theory will depend on radius of quantity, but you don't know which function of the radius. Clear? So you have a constraint on the functional relation of the quantity, but not on the specific function themselves. It's exactly the example I was giving yesterday on free energy under a normalization group. I can constrain how the free energy depends on the parameters, but I cannot tell you which function it is. Clear? So if you have a, a theory of rotational invariance, which morally is at this level, the only thing you can say is that my quantity will depend on function of the radius, but independent of the angle. Which function? Boo, I don't know. Okay? At this stage is what conformal symmetry does. Now, the rest of the story is pretty interesting because the rest of the story will be a theory which is not invariant under conformal transformation, which is not. So delta S will not be zero. However, I know delta S what will be. And from this point of view, as much as is equal to zero. So this is a very, very important point of all the story. Namely, usually we use symmetry to constrain something. Symmetry means the variation of the action has to be zero. And then you use this to encode it all the quantity, how they should depend it. But conceptually, to solve a theory, you do not need the, the variation to be zero. The only thing you know is what is on the right hand side. As far as you know what it is, and you can control perfectly what is on the right hand side, you can use this knowledge to crack the theory. Okay? So the rest of the story, I'm just anticipating uh, largely the rest of the story to make it in perspective. We are going to solve the theory of the fixed point not using conformal invariance the way I told you. Conformal invariance will constrain my general form. But I will show you that there will be a breaking, an anomaly, it's called in field theory. Namely, the action will not be invariant, but the crucial thing is that how is broken on the right hand side. And this will be enough. As far as I know how ds is equal, this will be the key point to crack the theory. Okay? So at this level, conformal group is a finite number of parameters. In four dimension is ten dimensional parameters, which is, for instance, the group or symmetry of the Maxwell equation in no charge, in no matter. I think I overcome uh, my time. Shall I, we have five minutes break very, very quickly or not? Or you want to go on? For me, it's the same. 
break. Okay. Five minutes, eh? Okay, so in general, in general, field theory which are uh, scaling invariant in D dimension satisfy these things. Please go. So we'll uh, we'll see later uh, that uh, these equations are uh, are uh, useful to uh, to constrain theory Okay, so these are general results in uh, D dimension for a theory which is scaling invariant and under the assumption I said. We'll see later that using this equation we'll have certain constraints, constraint on how correlation function, two point, three point, four points and so on, has to go. Once again, you can fix how they should depend on the coordinate, but not the function themselves. But let's see what, happen, what happens if I specialize these equations, which is called killing equations, in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, I have two indices. So I will have something like delta, I use one and two, so I will have delta one C one twice is equal, delta one one is one, two times D is one, if I take D equal to, and then I have D one C one plus D two C two. So I'm taking mu equal one, nu equal one. Which kind of equation I will have? So I have an equation which is delta one x one uh, is equal to delta two. So it is what I want. I'm not sure I want this. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's this, yeah. On the other hand, if I take mu equal 1 and mu equal 2, I will have delta 1 C2 plus delta 2 C1 has to be once again equal 0 this time. Because mu is different from mu. And so I will have delta mu X2 has to be equal minus delta 2 C1. Okay, so in a d equal two dimension, I have these equations here. Now, if uh, I define cleverly a complex variable z, in term of x1 plus i x2, and then I define a complex function c1 z plus i c2, so with this uh, position you realized that the conformal transformation in two dimensions collapse to the Riemann Cauchy equation for analytic functions. And as you know, conformal mapping in two dimensions is what people have used heavily since the 
19th century to solve problem of hydrodynamics, problem of electrodynamics, and so on, because you can take domain and map conformally into another domain, solving them easily and coming back. For instance, in electrostatic, when you solve problem in terms of images, so you can take uh, object which has certain set of charges, you map to the upper half plane where the images charges is very easy to put it and then you transform back. So what I want to say is that in two dimension, conformal transformations are given by a generic analytic function. Now you know that the space of analytic function is in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, the cauchy loran coefficient with respect to any point. Here I'm taking origin, but you can take another point of expansion. And now you are in a big, we are in a big trouble. Really big trouble. Why? Because I told you the space of conformal symmetry was finite. In particular, if you took the formula I wrote before, and I plug in d equal to, the conformal group should have six parameters. And now I come along and say, look guys, you have an infinite number of parameters you can play with. Because any analytic function, I can expand it. Therefore, I have a freedom. This is arbitrary, so this has to be arbitrary as well. And then I'm telling you the theory has to be invariant under an infinite number of parameters. Something odd is going on. There are some good news and bad news. The bad news is I'm cheating somewhere. There is no way out. The good news is uh, what about if this is true somehow? But this is true, is extremely good news because now I have a field theory that I can control in terms of infinite number of quantities, in terms of infinite number of parameters. So I might be able to solve the theory. Bad and good. First of all, about the bad. Where is the, where I'm fooling you? Sorry? Let's express in a more human language. <laughs> Say it again. Yeah. Any local transformation is this form. Eh, now become the, the difference. Now it start matter. And this is uh, the observation of uh, our uh, friends later. Namely, what is the only conformal transformation in two dimension which is small everywhere? Because I using all my argument was C was infinitesimal everywhere. Otherwise, I'm screwed up. Remember, all my previous consideration, I have X, I infinitesimally changed to something else. I didn't tell you where I'm changing. So it's to be true everywhere. So what is the function, analytic function, which is small everywhere? What it is? Constant. Liouville theorem. The only infinitesimal transformation everywhere is the constant. Otherwise, sooner or later, any analytic function is going to explode. No way out. Okay? 
The only things you can do, the best you can do, is the following. You can say, well, my function might explode at infinity. So somehow you put under the carpet all the bad things at infinity, whatever it is. So some point there and so on and so forth. Yeah, but this point there is on the same footing as all the other as soon as you use the Riemann sphere. So let's take this point of view that our space, the complex plane C, is compactified to the sphere. So the most you can do in order to have a conformal transformation that is one-to-one -one defined everywhere and locally is infinitesimal is the so-called Mabius transformation. So the only conformal transformation which is one-to-one -one mapping between the previous plane and the new one, so you are not stretching anything, you are not cutting, you are not doing uh, anything else, are very special bilinear transformation of this type. These are called Mabius. So these are the only transformation. So the space of analytic function is whatever. Infinite number of function that you can parameterize locally around the point Z0 in terms of the coefficient An. So it's an infinite dimensional space, even continuous. I mean, there is no way. However, among all of them, so a generic function, I don't know, might be something like Z cube, for instance. You say, well, looks so innocent. After all, it's a polynomial of Zn. So nice. What is the point? The point is then when you invert as a branch cut of the origin. Therefore, it's not unique. The new plane is related to the old one by n sheets transformation. So it's not one to one. Okay? So even power law, not to talking about guys which has already some crazy things in it, or if you take irrational values even more, even if you focus your attention on ordinary polynomial, they have a problem because they are not invertible. And they cannot be infinitesimally one and go because behind my physical consideration was that the new system is perfectly equivalent to the oldest one. Not that I'm changing the rule of the game. So I should be, I, am, I have to be sure that the function I'm employing in Polyakov argument, I can make it invertible at any point of the sphere. So it's to be the transformation which map the Riemann sphere into the Riemann sphere one to one. And there, is, there exists only one class of function that does so, they are the Mebius. The Mebius geometric is what I told you. You take a football, you're just rolling on the table. Any rolling is this one. For instance, if I take this sphere, I roll it in order to bring the North Pole to the South Pole, just take it, I'm essentially doing Z goes in 1 over Z. You go here, you see immediately that if you take A equal Z, 0, B equal 1, C equal 1, and D equal 0, belong to this transformation. Okay? Any other things are in correspondence with that. So the message is the global conformal transformation which I rely on the proof of Polyakov things are only those functions, not the most general one. If I'm going to use the most general one, my action is no longer invariant, will not invariant any longer. Okay? 
will change. The way it changes will be controlled by the so-called conformal word identity. We do later. But the message is, if I employ this infinitesimally, delta S will be zero. These are symmetry. These are not symmetry in general. And then we have to learn how to control the theory under this transformation. How many parameters as Mabius? You see immediately there are six real ones. Because A, B, C, D are complex, but then you might constrain, because after all of these things, by the determinant equal one, because you can see that the set of this transformation form a group. If you take two Mabius, transformation, so you can do from z, you go to a new variable, omega, so no omega, let's uh, call uh, u, and to a other variable v through Mabius, Mabius 1, Mabius 2, you realize immediately that there exists a relation which links z with v, which are a Mabius as well. So you want to compute it, what is this directly? The way of doing is associating these matrices to a, this uh, transformation to a matrix, which is done like this, A, B, C, D, and use the usual multiplication of matrices to get the transformation. So Mabius is a group with uh, composition law, which are those of a two by two matrices. And then I can choose the determinant to be 1. A, D minus B, C, I can choose to be 1. Say differently, the same Mabius transformation will be associated if I updating each parameter by lambda. So if I change A with lambda A, B with lambda B, C with lambda C, and D with lambda D, you will see that you get exactly the same as before. So I have an overall term that can never be fixed. By, so this means that in this matrix I can fix the determinant to be 1 without losing any generality. Okay? Clear? Clear? So the Mabius is not associated to the number themselves, but to a radius of this number. If I multiply them by a generic non-zero factor, the Mabius is exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. If we, we there took the parameters to be constant, these were symmetries of the action. A constant, you mean a rotation? Uh, Lawrence, uh, yeah, 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 sure. As far as you remain in the rotation, translation, uh, dilatation, they are symmetry. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, what I say is all my previous consideration in order to derive this uh, extended symmetry were based, and were based even though I didn't stress it, but were based on the fact that I'm doing infinitesimal transformation that I'm always remain one to one with the previous one. Sure. So this was there, even though I didn't stress it, but has to be there. Otherwise, I can never work to the first order consequences. So first order means I'm small. I derive, and then I arrive to the result that the theory will be invariant under an extended set of transformation. Fine. Then I say, but what about if I put d equal to in my previous things? And you realized that this killing equation, how they are called, degenerate to the Cauchy-Riemann equation which are defining for you an arbitrary analytic function. And then you jump on the chair and say, wow, if I got d equal to, therefore, I have an infinite symmetry of my theory. Because I can take any, any function, satisfy this killing equation, therefore, my theory has to be invariant. But you will uh, jump to the wrong conclusion. Because analytic function can be arbitrary large. And you cannot uh, reabsorb this arbitrary large into a change of transformation. The only way you can absorb this infinitely large behavior is with Mabius. Because 
if the function is arbitrarily large, means that you are nearby the North Pole. But the North Pole is on the same footing as any other pole on the sphere, so I can move it without stretching anywhere I want it. And therefore, it's the only transformation in which what appears to be infinity, as a matter of fact, is a disguise of the mapping. Because if I change the mapping without cutting anything, I can make it small at will. But if you have a divergence like z to the third power, you cannot do it. And the way you're understanding is that if you would have made the inverse map, the inverse map in this new manifold is three times arbitrary. There is a cut. So you have taken the Riemann sphere at In this case, the sphere has never been cut. It's always one-to-one. -one. So, making uh, the conclusion of all the argument before is in two dimension, the symmetry I was referring before in general has to coincide only with a specific set of transformation that magically is six-dimensional. It's, it's a conform, it's not, it's not translation, it's more, it's something more. Coincide with all the transformation of a football in, its, in itself, okay? So, what I want to say is, uh, the next question is, now we understand how to conciliate the Polyakov theorem with this new result in 2D. The way of conciliating is, we are fine, guys, there is no, no easy breakfast, these are the symmetries. These are only specific class. But the next question is, what the hell am I going to do with that? They are there. They satisfy locally this. So the only thing you know is that delta S will not be zero. They are not symmetry. But the question is, my I know what delta S is? Okay? It's clear? or not. Before, remember delta S the logic of the things was under infinitesimal transformation the action changed like this. Delta S is equal T mu nu So this was the variation of the action. We say if this guy here fulfill killing equation, this guy is zero. Symmetry means delta S equals zero. Now I'm saying this quantity, this transformation, satisfy locally Cauchy Riemann, so appear to be of the killing form, but cannot be a symmetry. And the reason is that this guy is not infinitesimal, so this formula will not, will not hold. Therefore, this term has to be different from zero. And the question is, can I control what is here? So delta S in this case is, and this will be the argument of the so-called conformal word identity. So in field theory, each time that you hear word identities, means for a symmetry which is broken, but is reestablished by an equation that tells you how to control it, the theory. Okay? This will arrive later. I'm just anticipating you that this transformation is not that you're taking and put in the basket. Because say, well, they do not satisfy Polygov, so I don't care. No. Polyakov is satisfied with Mabius. This one spoils Polyakov theorem, so it's not an invariance. But I will show you how to control what is the delta S here. Delta S will be something. And when I know what this something is, means I'm able to control the theory. This is the logic of the story. I have to build up step by step. So what I want to do today is to show you that using just a global transformation, I'm taking the point of view of two dimensions simply because our 
next topic will be in two dimensions. Using just global conformal symmetry, I can severely constrain two point and three point function. Remember, I have six parameters at my disposal. So it means I can enforce six parameters to know something. Okay? Symmetry means you are enforcing this one. So the next, uh, the next uh, topics will be conformal invariance. And when I say this means conformal symmetry, and symmetry, I mean it symmetry, implies that two point and three point functions of of course i have to tell you what means primary and what means Quasi primary. Okay. Okay, so back in this result, there is uh, the following uh, assumptions. The following assumption is nearby a fixed point exists an infinite number of scaling operators. So, scaling operator are those that if you rescale x by lambda, they are eigenvalues of the dilatation operator. So this is the definition of a scaling operator. Okay, so first of all, you say there is going to be an infinite number of scaling operators around each point. Each point means this spectrum of the dilatation operator. So back under all my constraints, there is the following things. There is an object, quantum object, which is the dilatation operator, D, that once I specify the critical point will give me the spectrum. So the spectrum of the dilatation operator will be this set of numbers. This set of number is the spectrum of the dilatation operator at specific point. If you change the point, the spectrum changes, even though the notion of operator is there. OK, clear? means I have a dilatation operation in my theory, but the way how it's implemented is different point by point. It's on the same level when you have a group theory, the way it's implemented, the symmetry depends on the representation you're using. Can you yeah, exactly. But I can linearize with respect to different points. Okay? Okay, so this is what scaling uh, operators are are fields which fulfill this story. Now, the next assumption you do, which is strong assumption, eh? so usually in physics, you commit yourself to something, and then when you solve it, check it that everything was okay. So there is a really a commitment. The second one is that the scaling operator form a basis. This is a very, very strong story. The fact that they exist seems obvious, as far as you know phenomenology of critical phenomena. Something is scaling, so it's power law, so it has to exist. So what is non-trivial is that if you take any operators, this can be expanded in uh, power series in, I mean, can be expanded in terms of this uh, 
scaling operator basis. So they form a basis. I'm not proving, it's an assumption. Okay? Strong assumption. My scaling field describes everything. You are just declaring, I need just to know them. Because any other quantity I can always read, re, written down in terms of them is an assumption. I stress it. Okay. Then we'll see later what this assumption goes on. At this stage, I need to define this and to tell you that they are the basic quantity of the theory. This is only things you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's local. Now, the, the beauty of the theory is that the locality is the driving force of everything. So everything has to be local satisfied. Okay, that being said, now I have to define you what is primary and semi-primary operator. Now, the things we have to, to do to uh, define this object is uh, we have to general, uh, generalize the concept of tensor. Now, tensor in uh, geometry, in field theory, is some quantity which has index such that contract So a tensor of order n means that if you contract this index with all the infinitesimal transformation, this quantity is a scalar. Means that if you compute the new in the new transformation, frame, you have this identity. Okay? which is nothing else to say that the old one depends on the new one by the Jacobian. Okay? So this is a mnemonic way. The mnemonic way to remember how tensor transform is you take a tensor with some index, you contract with the infinitesimal volume. At this point is a scalar. Scalar is the same in any frame. You rewrite the same scalar in the new frame. And therefore, you get that the old one is transformed with the new one with all kind of... Jacobian, you need it. Clear? Guys, it's a trick. It's a trick how you remember things. Usually you have been learned tensor transform the Jacobian, blah, blah, blah. I never remember if it's X divide X prime or the vice versa. The way of remembering is this. You write it down, the old one in terms of the previous volume, you make a scalar, and you rewrite the scalar in the new coordinate. Nothing else, nothing more. Okay? Now, this notion, you generalize here in the following sense. So, we have to do the following uh, gymnastic. The gymnastic is the following. In two dimensions, we have two real coordinates. This is our physical space. So you want to study your easy model in a sample which is x1 and x2. Okay? I'm defining easy model on this 
plane, I need to know what happened to this point. X1 and X2 are physical, real coordinate. The first thing I'm going to do is collecting them in a complex variable. At this point, I'm not losing anything. Two real is equivalent to one complex. But then I'm going to do something crazy. Something crazy is I'm going to define some z bar variable, which of course is the complex conjugate of the other one. But pretending, which is an independent variable. So the things I'm going to do is uh, I'm pretend that from now on I will have a theory defined in terms of two coordinates, which I call z and z bar, where a priori z bar has nothing to do with z, it's another quantity. But of course, the physical space, so this is essentially C2 theory. My physical one is when I identify Z bar with the complex conjugation. So I enlarge my space of variable, Z and Z bar, as they are independent. But of course, to recover the physical one, I have to identify Z bar with Z star. So making indeed Z bar to be what was from the natural definition. Now you might ask, why the hell are you doing this baroque construction, these crazy things? For a very good reason, because we will see later in a minute, the beauty of conformal field theory is that you transform essentially two-dimensional problem which is complicated, in one dimension. In one dimension in the right variable, which is z. So say differently, we will see in the due course that the dependence on z and z bar of any quantity split it. Like they are living in two different worlds. So we'll carry on all my analysis of one copy of it, essentially z, and once I finish this, I glue them together with this condition, that the z bar part that was there, it was simply a copy, I have to identify with the physical one, imposing that will be the z bar something else. Now this is highly non-trivial stuff. We'll see later how to do it. But this is the key point, mapping two dimensions in one dimension. You know, in, if in physics you have one-dimensional problem, piece of cake of solving, morally. Okay? Here is the same. So you start from two dimensions, but the dependence of this dimension enter in a very specific combination. So x1 cannot be independent from x2, because I have conformal symmetry behind. Conformal symmetry is naturally expressed in terms of z is the right variable for the theory. We'll see later that I can introduce another quantity that formally is this complex conjugation, but just at, at this level of introducing, but you can introduce formally as a new quantity, so your space will be essentially C2, but the physical one will be project out with this condition. This is the key point of the story. Okay? So the splitting of z and z bar part. I will prove it later. For the time being, let me assuming, because we'll simplify our life. So from this point of view, I'm going to define what is uh, a quasi-primary fields, a tensor quotation of weight d and d bar where d bar stays for the dilatation of the z bar part, which under Mabius transformation transform like this. If you take the infinitesimal one in this way, 
they are exactly equal to the new one in the new coordinate like this. Okay? So quasi primary are associated to a scalar quantity which is the field which labeled by delta delta bar multiply the infinitesimal volume dz and dz bar but to crazy power because this delta can be irrational. So strictly speaking a tensor is always integers. One, two, three, Jacobami. We have no other choices for tensor. In this case we are crazy enough to construct scalar quantity in terms of differential and volumes which are arrays to crazy power. So say differently, a quasi-primary operator is that operator that under Mabius only transform like this. Okay, definition. So quasi-primary are spatial scaling operator. So they are scaling operator, but there are spatial ones. And quasi-primary op operators are those scaling operators that if I change my coordinate according to Mabius, they transform as a tensor of weight delta and delta bar with respect to analytic and anti-analytic part. Okay? So this is quasi-primary. And primary operator, on the other hand, are those, I use the same notation, but... Uh, are those which transform as a tensor of order delta and delta prime under a generic analytic transformation. Okay? It's a definition, guys. It's nothing else. Eh? There is nothing to understand. It's a definition. Definition is scaling operator, but within the scaling operator, there are, so all scaling operators are equally, but there are some one more equal than the others. And these more equals than the other are the quasi-primary, which transform under Mabius as a tensor, and primary, which transform as a tensor under all generic things. Now, to make the story in perspective, is when you want to build up irreducible representation of a group. What you do, you have the maximal weight. You use vector, which are the maximal weight, to construct the representations. So this field, I'm telling you, will be the field under which we'll build up the irreducible representation of the conformal group. Okay? So this is why they are selected out. All vector plays the same game. Yeah, but someone is more efficient than the other. Okay? I will stop it because then otherwise we go over. No, yeah. So the point is, uh, let's be clear. I'm using uh, all omega bar, d bar, all this bar to denote it the part which concerns the z bar part. They are not the complex conjugate of the other, are different functions, different numbers. I'm just using this notation in order not to become a notation which become over, over Baroque, but they have to think that delta bar is not the complex conjugate of delta, it's another numbers. 
So omega bar is not the Mabius where you take the bar of the previous one. It's another transformation which refers to the omega variables, omega bar variables. Okay? At the end of the day, when you pose this uh, cosette I was giving you, will give you a constraint on delta and delta bar. For instance, for scalar field, delta bar has to be equal to delta. For spinor field, delta bar has to be delta plus half integers. For modular invariance, delta minus delta bar has to be multiple of eight, whatever. So you have extra condition later. But at this stage, there are just two independent parameters. Okay? Okay, I will stop here. Somehow we have set the stage for the next, uh, for the next uh, things. And then later I am going to show you the conformal symmetry uniquely fixed two entry point function in this case. Okay. Okay.